Hello and welcome to another edition of Down the Middle with Demartino Booth. I am Danielle Demartino Booth and it is my great pleasure and honor to have with us today Mike Green. Uh, I first learned of Mike's work, I don't know why, only about a year ago. Uh, where have you been, Mike, is my first question. Uh, and and it's, it's so incredibly important that you listen to everything that Michael has to say about the foundations of passive investing indexing. What got us to that point? There is a history there. Uh, but first, we're going to start off with a bit of background on Mike. So uh, it was our collective senior year in high school. Walk Like an Egyptian was the number one song. <laughs> I can, I've can still got every single lyric down, Walk Like an Egyptian, every single one. October, let's see, no, August the 11th. So we're just getting ready to go back to school. A gentleman by the name of Alan Greenspan has his first day at work at the Federal Reserve. So we go to school after Labor Day and uh, come, come Sunday, August, excuse me, come Sunday, October the 18th, you're talking your parents into playing hooky the next day. Can you uh, can you explain? Uh, well, it, in really simple terms, it wasn't actually even playing hooky the next day. It was as we woke up in the morning, uh, the news was that the market was crashing. So I was in California. So I had the advantage of a three hour delay. So by the time I'm awake at 6.30 in the morning, uh, there's an extraordinary event in play in New York City. Uh, and I, of course, convinced my parents that I'm running a fever and not feeling well, and I'm going to have to stay home from school. Both of them worked. Um, and they were, you know, pretty much, okay, well, you know, you're 17 years old, you know what you're doing. Um, as long as you're not telling us it's a test, et cetera, it was a Monday. So, yep. you know, fairly reasonable, hadn't been out drinking the night before or anything like that. And um, long story short, I, I stayed home and watched the crash of 87 on, on the TV. And... This is like uh, it Ferris was, Bueller's day off, but it's like Mike Green's day yeah, off. Yeah, exactly. This is, yes, Ferris Bueller travels throughout Chicago doing all sorts of interesting things. Mike Green sits in front of the TV with a bowl of cereal and, and watching the world fall apart. Wow. It was just, I mean, it really was one of those things that you had to watch if you had any interest whatsoever in financial markets. Um, and at that point, I had already uh, applied for early acceptance to the University of Pennsylvania. And so I Kind of knew I was going to head off to, to Wall Street or, or, you know, at least to Wharton, at least initially. Um, and I just I couldn't miss the event. And it was worth every, you know, every moment of that, uh, that, that fake sore throat and fever. <laughs> I mean, you could not have chosen, had you engineered it homemade, you could not have chosen a better time to go put four years in in school as 1987 turned out to be a moment, yeah. not an event. Yeah. How, it was, uh, it, how it, was it though, be going from a West Coast, I mean, you grew up Valley guy, how was that transitioning over to you know, Pennsylvania? Yeah. Well, it, for me, actually, it was weird because it felt very much the minute I walked onto the Penn campus and, and the Wharton uh, school, it literally felt like I was going home. Um, you know, I had always had kind of an intensity on the West Coast that uh, I would say is it's a more, you know, the West Coast is much more relaxed in these components. And, and so I always had a relatively high level of intensity on either academic subjects or things that I was interested in. Hitting the East Coast for the first time, you come into contact with New Yorkers and people from New Jersey. And, you know, all of a sudden there's kind of that intensity and speed that's missing when you're growing up on the West Coast and surrounded by people who are into surfing and, and all sorts of stuff. Um, I certainly had my fair share of that, but uh, for me, it was a very natural transition and I really didn't have any compelling reason to go back to California um, other than uh, a period in the 1990s. I, I moved back to California. It started and ran a, a software company that I then sold in 99. Um, but other than that brief window, I never really spent any time in California moved back in 2017 and now I can actually sit back and enjoy a little bit more of the relaxed pace. I'm, I'm sitting here without shoes on and uh, enjoying <laughs> myself in my, my uh, shelter at home uh, office. But a really cool background, by the way. I mean, that's, that's it's just an old map of uh, San Francisco Bay. So it's uh, if, if, if I were to put my my arm up, you can basically find me right right up there. So that's cool. Well, um, so let's go back further than that. Uh -oh. Let's go back 
to no, no, we're not going to go back into it into the days that you you know you might have been drinking the night before. No, we're not going there. Um, let's go back to the beginning of markets. What wow. was a market, and when did the market that we refer to it today? Because if you're if you're talking to anybody, you know what what the market do today, and mm-hmm. they're talking about the stock market, but that certainly was not always the case. Well, it, it certainly wasn't the case. So when you talk about markets, I mean, markets themselves, think about, you know, the, the most traditional form of it is just, a you know, you go to a souk, right? Or you go to a, a market where people are selling wares, you're effectively being, bringing together uh, uh, those who have acquired goods and those who are seeking goods, right? Um, that's all a stock market is. It's just a market that happens to be for pieces of paper that represent various corporate entities, right? And so most people tend to forget that history. They, don't, they, they think of it as differently than going to the store because it is actually different, right? Very few of us grew up in an environment where we had exposure to a souk or a you know, uh, uh, flea market sort of environment where there's negotiating and haggling that's going on. But that's all the stock market is, is it's effectively the meeting of people who want to haggle over the price of those pieces of paper, what we refer to as Q. And so the, the data that we see on markets is actually just a history of transactions that have occurred in those markets, right? And that's kind of one of the important things to remember as we think about what markets are doing. There's buyers and there's sellers. We only see the, inter- the intersection of those two where a transaction actually occurs. We don't have any data in terms of what was the market depth. We don't know how deep was the market prior to the crash of 1987. We don't know how deep was the market prior to the crash in 1929. We don't know what the tipping point was in terms of, of those underlying components. And for me, that's the most interesting part about markets is trying to actually understand what happens when you step just outside of where that transaction occurred. If it had gone another point, if it had gone two more points, was there depth that then would have created a discontinuity? And that was really, for me, the most interesting thing that I've learned since coming out of the theoretical background in high school, in college is all of the models that we, we use and that we assume when we think about markets, when we talk about efficient market hypothesis, or we talk about modern portfolio theory, or we talk about the crash of 1987 and the assumptions that sat behind it, the assumptions are one of a continuous market where you can always transact. And what 1987 really was, was a discontinuous market. It was a market where the next transaction was so large that nobody was willing to stand in front of it. So when did the modern stock market as we think of it? Is this, is, was, this, was this a moment under a tree in New York uh, in front of the New York Stock Exchange as we know it today? Did it precede that? Well, there are, there are histories of stock markets that go back to the early 1600s, right? So we have the examples of the Dutch stock market with the Dutch East India Company, et cetera. So those have been around for four or 500 years. But when we talk about a modern stock market, right? There's never a there's a contemporary stock market. There's never a modern stock market, right? It's constantly undergoing evolution. And so, if you look back to the Buttonwood Tree, and I think it was 1789 in terms of the founding of the New York Stock Exchange, or what they label as the founding of the New York Stock Exchange, you know, you were trading claims on companies primarily fixed income. There was some element of equity trading that was going on. Equity did not resemble what we talk about today. They were, in many situations, full liability corporations. So your analysis would have to include, could you be sued or could you be held liable for the debts that were incurred by this entity over and above the capital that had been invested? And those things have changed over the past 200 years, right? The rules of what we're transacting, the definition of what we're transacting, the obligations and rights associated with that have all changed. In its most modern you know, form, to use the language that you, you, you describe, I would suggest that most of what we think of as the stock market today kind of began in the early 1980s with the introduction of products like futures, with the introduction of liquid option markets, um, and a tremendous growth of both fixed income and equity markets on exchanges that might not have existed prior to that, right? Pink sheets, for example, were actually a real thing. And there were many companies that were not actively traded on exchanges. 
those rules began to change quite dramatically with the introduction of the dealer brokerage market, the NASDAQ, right? The, Na the National Association of Securities Dealers, which created markets for those, et cetera. So I, like, I kind of would put it back to that 1981, 1982 time period, which of course feels like the beginning of the, the first you know, great bull market, which I might yeah. suggest has actually continued. Um, but that would kind of be where I would start if you're starting to think about it. And again, I was just very fortunate to come into a theoretical understanding of that at a relatively young age, you know, kind of 12 years, 10 years into the, the, the modern market to, to again, use the lexicon. Um, so along those same lines, uh, when, was, when was the S&P 500? When did that come about? Uh, in, in fact, probably the next person I, I interview after you is <clears throat> gonna be a dear friend of mine, Howard Silverblatt, who's, he's only been with S&P for I think 43 or 44 years yeah. now. Um, yeah. He's a walking, talking spreadsheet. It's just frightful. Uh, and when, when there's a shift in this index, it's, it's a monumental moment inside S&P. But how long has the spider, you know, dollar sign SBX, how long has that existed? So the S&P itself was created in 1957. Um, at the time, it had only 200 stocks in the index, and then it was widened to 500 stocks um, in a tradable format. There used to be a product referred to as in the initial in introduction of futures. There was something called the OEX, which was the S&P 100. That was far more liquid in terms of trading activity than the S&P 500 was, in large part because the calculation intensity the ability to get a computer to very quickly run a replication or an arbitrage construction on 500 stocks was far more difficult than to do it on 100 stocks. Gives you some idea of the advances that have occurred in our lifetime. Mainframes used to take up entire rooms. Exactly. I, I, I very distinctly remember um, sitting at, in a um, uh, investment training course at Spearleads and Kellogg, where I, I worked when I was at, at uh, Penn. Um, and you know, the, uh, a representative from Merrill Lynch came in and explained that the street now had a full pentabyte of information in terms of data that had been collected in terms of the total amount of information that was available on Wall Street, right? And you, you stop and you think about how quaint that is today relative to, you know, we're all sitting around on our desktops at the time. I think the IBM AT had just come out and had a uh, 30 megabyte hard drive. Right. And so, you know, that's a small email attachment today. Yep. Um, so the world has changed quite dramatically over that time period. But the, the SPX began in 1957. It was introduced in futures form in 1982. Um, you know, we can talk through some of these components, but, you know, one of my favorite uh, references is actually going back to that point, Warren Buffett in a 1982 commentary to the SEC that actually was then published in Business Week magazine, another somewhat archaic reference um, in 19, after the crash in 1987, you know, it was brought to light that Warren Buffett's commentary on futures was he could see a, a quote as I see logical risk reducing strategy that involves shorting the futures contract. I see no corresponding investment or hedging strategy whatsoever on the long side. Wow. And, and so when you think about futures and, and kind of the swashbuckling, you know, Paul Tudor Jones of the 1980s, what was really going on with futures throughout that entire time period is, is that they were the province of commodity traders. They were the province of people who were either looking to hedge out their risk. Jim Chanos famously started Kinecos Advisors using futures to offset the equity market exposure, exposing his alpha, for example. Um, but nobody really had a use for futures for another almost 14 years, 13 years. It wasn't really until the mid 1990s that we began to use them in something that resembles their current form, where significant use was was created on the long side. Well, that that kind of brings us uh, back in time. I remember when I was on Wall Street and I first started to sense what the Federal Reserve was and the role it was playing. But in your evolution as an investor, in your evolution as a student of the markets and somebody stu studying the structure, when did the, when did the Federal Reserve first come onto your radar screen? Because it was a lot later in life than October the 20th, 1987, when Alan Greenspan put out an advisory that the Federal Reserve stood ready to back the banking and financial systems and within days and weeks was 
leaking information to Wall Street bond trading desks ahead of Fed moves to inject liquidity in the system. I mean, is it 1987 that the Fed put was born? But I didn't know squat about the Fed until me personally, the, the, the run up to the 90s, uh, the, the dot com days. Yeah, so, so people tend to forget that when Alan Greenspan came on, as you pointed out, he, he started in August and by October, we had a crisis on our hands, right? So Paul Volcker was viewed as, you know, the greatest Fed chair in history. He had saved America from inflation. Now, I obviously, uh, you know, you, you may have heard me dispute that, and I have some real questions about those dynamics. Um, but Alan Greenspan did step in in 1987 and did something really important. It wasn't so much the offered to bail out the banking system as what he really did was he facilitated the provision of lines of credit and made good the lines of credit for the market makers, right? right. The specialist firms. So I mentioned Spearleads and Kellogg, which was the largest specialist firm on the New York Stock Exchange at the time. I actually traded commodities for them. But the, um, the challenge that you had as a market maker is that you used large amounts of leverage against a relatively small capital base to facilitate orderly transactions in a then manual order book where orders would come in and you would actually try to match a buyer and seller. And if there was an inability to match that buyer and seller, you would put your capital up against it. Mm -hmm. And so in the crash of 87, the specialist firms had extended their capital and used borrowed money to buy stocks to try to facilitate a liquid market as the market fell out from under them. The losses that they faced on those books made their bankers, their banking relationships nervous. They then pulled the credit lines for the specialist firms, which destroyed the liquidity. Effectively, there was no bid at that point. And Alan Greenspan is in the air, flying Correct. home from Dallas. So you've got the head of the New York Stock Exchange. I'm good friends with Arthur Cashin. So I, yep. I wasn't in the pits at the time, but Arthur Cashin's walked me through that day. But continue. Yeah, I know. So, so Art Cashin actually is the gentleman responsible for getting a hold of Alan Greenspan and saying, look, this thing is going to go straight to zero unless you guarantee the specialist firms and get these lines of credit back open. Yep. That was where Greenspan stepped in and said, okay, listen, we'll make, you, we'll make the banking system whole on any losses associated with specialist firms not being able to make good on these bets, right? And that's really what they were at that point is just that they were bets. Uh, that was kind of the first introduction of the Fed put. It, played a significant role in halting the panic associated with 87. But interestingly enough, I would actually say that that, that wasn't really where the activist, I mean, it may have been where it was born, but that was kind of untouched for a period of time. Like the Fed didn't really play that active of a role in markets, at least on my analysis, until we came to kind of the LTCM type dynamics. And at that point, at well, least the, 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 the tequila crisis, the tequila uh, crisis in Mexico, yep. Orange County went poof in the same year. So, but yes, long-term capital management. Well, with long-term capital management, something changed on a, on a structural basis, right? So the Fed suddenly began focusing its interest rate activity, its interest rate movements on not fighting inflation, which is what it had done since basically the 1970s. Instead, it shifted to trying to manage the expectations channel by preventing collapse of asset prices, right? So one of the challenges of the 1970s and the breakdown, and so now you have to go all the way back you know, to that time period. If you think about the 1970s, we kind of had this very simple me mechanistic view, which is you know, the sort of Keynesian or, or post-Keynesian view that, well, we could manage demand by the government increasing taxes, increasing spending. We could keep unemployment low. We could keep the economy going, et cetera. And in the 1970s, many of those relationships broke down or at least indicated failure, right? So the Phillips curve, for example, which is supposed to govern the relationship between unemployment and inflation, we simultaneously had high unemployment and high inflation, which is not supposed to happen, right? The it's demand the component. Yep. And so the Fed very much had to shift to fighting inflation, or at least what they thought they were doing was fighting inflation. And that changed in 1998 and it became very clear in terms of the relationship of interest rates and asset prices that what had been a phenomenon of taking the punch bowl away to use the the warren miller reference or the arthur miller i'm sorry um reference warren miller is a ski uh documentary maker um the uh you know you took away the the, the old reference was you would take away the punch bowl by raising interest rates and reducing speculation. 
Post-1998, it became when a negative financial event occurred, i.e. financial conditions tightened, the Fed would respond by cutting interest rates to try to facilitate borrowing, to try to facilitate lending activity, et cetera. And that was a very substantive structural change that occurred in 1998. It's very clear in the data. And in my view, that's kind of the origin of much of what we refer to or bemoan as the activist Fed. Okay, well, I'll have to send you a very boring paper I did about 1998 and long-term capital management when I was inside the Fed. Yep. So if, if you can get through compliance at the Federal Reserve, it's not going to be too, it, it won't keep you up. So, okay. Um, so 1998, uh, at that time, where was Vanguard? Where was passive investing? Where were, was there even an ETF back then? I don't think so. So, yeah. um, but, but, but take us back to 1998, 1995, that era. So if you go back to that point and, and you know, if you're thinking about the growth of passive investing or where Vanguard was, right? So circa 1994, 1995, Vanguard and all other index providers are less than 2% market share, right? So very small relative to the overall investment universe. Vanguard was obviously the leader even at that point. Uh, but two important things happened in that time period. The first was in 1994, the Levitt administration of the SEC uh, did a giant study on derivatives because the challenge that you had had prior to that point was that mutual funds were restricted from using leverage in most situations by the Investment Company Act of 1940. They were also prohibited from buying securities that could have a first claim on assets effectively leverage, which included derivatives. And in derivatives are also included futures. So the Levitt administration did a giant study in 1994, evaluating the risk of allowing mutual funds to use derivatives, as in particular futures is really what they were focused on, less on puts and calls as we think of derivatives. Uh, and the reason that this appears to have had a lot of impetus is tied to the challenges that Vanguard and others, even at that small size, were having in maintaining their index provider focus. Right, so they began to experience what's called tracking error, where you know you would issue an S and P 500 fund. You're supposed to very closely track the index, but if you're not using futures to track that index, you're forced to go out and try and buy every individual security. Some of those securities are much less liquid than others, and by participating in that manner, you're influencing the price of those securities in your portfolio relative to the index. That then means that you have tracking error and that's the kiss of death for an index provider strategy. And so that whole SEC investigation of derivatives in 1994 appears to have been done to facilitate index providers beginning to use futures and address this issue of tracking error. And when that happened, it led to an explosion of the utility of futures, right? So as a equity market participant in the late 1990s, while most people were very focused on the dot-com dynamics, the single most interesting thing that was actually happening was the explosion of volume that was going through futures and beginning to go into index funds, which grew rapidly from kind of 2% to about 10% over the next couple of years. So, um, so that would be, if you will, that watershed moment, was that, was that the big bang for passive investing or was there more market history to come? Did, was, was passive investing, was there a moment later in time that it became the end all be all because it, I, and, and, and actually at the time, I mean, one of my biggest clients at the time was trading massive spider futures, just massive hedging his portfolio. I mean, the, the world was blowing up. I mean, because I, I was on Wall Street during the late 1990s. And you've got this other guy slinging it around with, with SPYs every day in and out. Yeah. But was there a different catalyst? Was there a big bang moment for passive investing? So I, that was one of the key catalysts, right? So, so that period, 95, 96, the beginning of what Greenspan referred to as irrational exuberance. In my analysis, this is largely tied to the growth of passive investing and the use of those futures. And, and just very quickly, the reason why that happened was because the indices were improperly constructed at the time. They were built on what's called a market cap weighted basis. Mm 
which means that you're trying to buy shares in proportion to the total shares outstanding. The unique feature of the 1990s was that you had a number of large market cap, low float companies that had what we used to refer to as high levels of insider ownership. And so these would be companies like Walmart and Microsoft and Cisco and Dell, right? When the index providers were trying to buy these in proportion to their market cap relative, rather than the float adjusted weightings that were available, the actual shares that you could have purchased it meant in companies like Microsoft or Dell that you were trying to buy twice as many shares as were actually available. If you try to buy twice as much of something, you're going to cause it to outperform. That led to the dot-com cycle. Now, I sat outside this as a, as a you know, value manager and, and basically watched some components of this. Similar to what we're seeing today, that construction of indices led to dramatic underperformance of value investing because you were not you know, basically benefiting from this. So they tended to be older companies that had all of their shares outstanding, et cetera, right? And they also did not fall into the technology space. So there became some very serious disconnects that occurred. Um, that was kind of the first part of the growth of index investing was the, the facilitation of that. The second thing that happened was in 2004, 2005, they changed the structure of the indices. And then a very important, but you know, somewhat um, innocuous change was made in the 401k space, which was the introduction of what were called qualified default investment alternatives. And this is part of the pension protection, uh, I think it's called the Pension Protection Act of 2005. The idea was very simple, that up to that point, if you went to work for a company and you received a 401k and you saved money into a 401k, there were two things that people were worried about. One was relatively low levels of participation in 401ks. That was a function of you as an employee had to make a decision when you joined a company that you were gonna participate in the 401k. Optic. So it was an active choice. Um, in 2005, they changed that. They turned it into a passive or the default choice so that when you work, went to work for a company, you were automatically enrolled in a 401k unless you refused to, to do so. So that single change was huge in terms of participation. The second thing that happened was um, when you used to go to work for a company and get a 401k, you had to actively choose what products you would invest in. If you didn't make a choice, it would just go into a money market fund. And so your money effectively would not be invested. In 2005, that changed with the introduction, as I said, of, of QDIAs, Qualified Default Investment Alternatives, which meant that your corporate HR manager was selecting a fund that became the default. And almost inevitably that became some form of balanced or passive vehicle. And that was then further changed in 2012 with uh, additional regulatory changes under the Bureau of Labor, uh, the Department of Labor that switched it almost exclusively to target date funds. And so target date funds have been by far the fastest growing space in the industry They've gone from not existent in 2003. They literally did not exist prior to 2003. Um, by 2012, they became the default. And today, nearly 80% of all dollars going into 401ks are flowing into target date funds. 80%. 80%. Um, well, in, 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 the, the, the really crazy statistic is in excess of 60% of 401ks now only have a single vehicle in them, which is the target date fund. Um, since I left the Federal Reserve, I've been doing my own investing, so I'm, I'm really happy I don't know about these uh, innovations, shall we say. No. Um, before moving on, because I, I want to get to a congressional testimony uh, that Janet Yellen gave a few years ago, which I just shocked me because she was aware of ETFs. So that, that, that was the first part that shocked me. But when we hear the word passive, uh, you know, you, you think of something as, as being the opposite of assertive, active, <laughs> active aggressive, yeah. but explain in just, just consider me to be a monkey. So explain how passive investing is not passive. So just to very quickly define what people refer to when they typically talk passive versus active. A passive product is one whose investment scheme, the, the approach that it takes to investing, uh, 
has been built into an index or into a, a, a methodology that does not change over time. And almost when I refer to passive, I'm referring to things that are float weighted or market cap weighted, not attempting to make a distinct bet in terms of what are the best companies, what are the worst companies, et cetera, right? No fundamentals. No, you don't care about fundamentals. You are accepting the information that you're receiving from the market in terms of the last price is the right price, right? The rationale for passive investing is tied back to the efficient market hypothesis, which is the idea that as any individual, you can't outguess everybody else. You can't figure out information better than everyone else. And so in aggregate, all of the active managers, those who are making active decisions in their portfolios will give you the same results as the passive exposure because you're buying the market price and therefore you're better off going with a passive investment that can charge lower fees because it's not actually trying to do any quote unquote work. It's simply riding off of everybody else's work, all right? The challenge with that is that if you look at the theoretical underpinnings of that model, that theoretical model that passive investing can piggyback on, it's built on the work of a gentleman called Bill Sharp, who won the Nobel Prize in finance for his work on things like modern portfolio theory, the CAPM model, Sharp ratios, et cetera. Um, and his paper in 1991 called The Arithmetic of Active Management made a very simple declaration of what passive investing was, which is that a passive investor is one who never transacts. They simply maintain exposure to the market, right? That was the rationale behind it. The problem is, is that that doesn't fit the actual implementation of passive. Because when you think about somebody who's trying to have exposure to the market, the only way that you can get that exposure is by buying or selling. And the minute you do that, it makes you an active investor. You yourself become a participant who are now influencing market prices. That history of transactions that I described as what a market represents or market prices represent, you've now participated in it. You've joined that stampede in one form or another. And the perverse aspect of passive investing is that they are actually the most motivated players because they have the world's simplest algorithms. Did you give me cash? If so, then buy. Did you ask for cash? If so, then sell. There's no consideration in that for what price should I buy at? What valuation should I buy at? Should I maybe hold cash for a better opportunity? No, you can't do any of those things. Your money is literally just being forced into the market regardless of the underlying conditions. So, I mean, you know, to me, what you're describing sounds like trillions and trillions and trillions of dollars. And we can pop a slide up at some point where we can see the growth of indexing, which has been pretty extraordinary. But, but what you're describing is trillions of dollars of investors putting in a bunch of orders at the market, which we were told was kind of risky behavior because that you were gonna get somebody else's uh, price, not the, the price you necessarily needed to make sure that you got for your client but it just sounds like buy at the market, sell at the market. And I mean, you, this can go on until you hit infinity. So it's not quite that extreme, but, but yes, and really, you know, to simplify, yes, that is, you know, I, in no, I, I do not think that Vanguard or BlackRock is behaving in a uh, irresponsible manner, trying to plow those dollars to work into the market. They are absolutely seeking best execution within the market. I have complete faith that they're doing that. But what is being what, what people are failing to consider and what our research really focuses on is the cumulative impact of continual buying with no consideration for fundamentals. And more importantly, actually, and this is where our research is somewhat unique, is that we've focused on the dynamics of what happens when you transition between different investor types, when you move away from the discretionary investor who's thoughtful about what does valuation mean, if you fire them and give money to passive investments that simply assume whatever price is the right price, you're going to change the market itself. You're actually going to change the way the market behaves. You're gonna change the, the values at which uh, markets transact. You're gonna change the value of cash Right, so under an active manager or a discretionary manager framework, 
cash can be viewed as a drag, but it also creates extraordinary optionality because uniquely among the assets that I hold, it gives me the ability to buy something without having to sell something else. Right. Optionality. You get optionality. When you move to a passive strategy that holds no cash, you lose that optionality, right? And so that's a big chunk of what you're actually giving up. You effectively are turning cash into a toxic asset. And if and we saw this in the oil market, for example, just this year, where if you have a toxic asset, you eventually may be forced to pay people to, give, to take it from you, right? Oil prices went negative because nobody could find storage to store this toxic product. Cash is functionally the same to a passive investor. Um, so walk us through why, so I'm, I'm gonna give a good friend of mine, Jim Bianco, I'm not sure if you know Jim, but a good friend of mine, Jim Bianco, um, gave me a few statistics. This was in January, I was actually out in your neck of the woods. I was, on, I, I was in California at the time at a double line event. And when we were there, he said, and I checked with him this morning, the US has more than 12,000 investment advisory firms. They employ more than 400,000 people offering investment advisory services. More than 35 million investors use investment advisors whose assets recently topped 70 trillion. 88% of investment advisors currently use or recommend ETFs for their clients. No other investment vehicle has a higher usage, not even cash. Yeah. So that's, if, if I've understood some of your prior comments, that is not necessarily, there's probably overlap, but that is not necessarily one in the same, that $70 trillion pile with 401k investing. Not at all. And so the, the, the vast majority of 401ks are actually managed now within corporations using out, you know, outsourced service providers. Uh, you know, examples would be like Voyo Financial or others, right? Mm -hmm. They will offer a limited menu of investment vehicles. You can choose in many situations to opt out and self do what's called self-direct your 401k. That requires many additional steps in order to go through that process. And so it's one that very few people take advantage of. Um, but that tends to be an asset pool that is separate and distinct from what you're referring to when you talk about registered investment advisors. Mm -hmm. Um, the registered investment advisor space has been another area of growth. And part of the reason why that growth has occurred is the general pressure on fees in this industry. And that in part can be thought of as a byproduct of the, dis the disappearance of high interest rates, right? So you can afford to pay somebody 1% of your assets or 2% of your assets when your cash is earning 6%, right? When that hurdle rate is effectively there, when your cash is earning zero, those costs become very adverse to your portfolio. And so there's just been tremendous pressure on fees in the industry, both at the portfolio manager level and the portfolio management company level, and also at the registered investment advisor level. And so there's been an extraordinary adoption of ETFs and index funds that can be offered by registered investment advisors at effectively no fees while they themselves are then able to charge, you know, typically a 1% type fee on their clients' assets. And so their clients are getting a quote unquote reasonably priced dynamic. But the other thing that you're hitting on is, is that this is actually a big industry. It has a lot of people that work in it. Those people are often lambasted for working against their client interests. I'll be honest with you, that's the exception in my experience rather than the rule. The vast majority of people really do want the best for their clients. Um, but we've been somewhat hamstrung by the idea that the industry can't add value, right? That uh, effectively, like, why would you do anything other than buy the S&P 500 or, you know, buy the NASDAQ, right? And part of that, I would actually argue, is, it, is an unfortunate byproduct of money flowing into those strategies, right? So if a market is not frictionless, and money is flowing into a strategy, it's going to raise the price of the securities that are in that strategy. That increase in price is what we call a return, right? That's a capital gain. And so we actually see outperformance that is being created by these very dynamics. The problem of course, is what happens when people try to exit the system 
And what are the false signals that are received on an economic basis from prices that are increasingly detached from fundamentals? Um, so have there been any moments in the past few years that you've seen stress in the passive space? Stress that was maybe quashed, but are there, have there been times that you've kind of seen cracks start to erupt in the system? Yes, very clearly. I mean, so the, the two most obvious ones, three most obvious ones that I would point to, and they, they tend to be a byproduct of the same thing that, that you hear me referring to, which is effectively crowded strategies, right? So when a strategy becomes crowded, it works great until people try to get out or an exit needs to be obtained, right? And then you suddenly discover in, in Warren Buffett lexicon, you know, who's swimming naked, right? Um, the, 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 the events that I would point to, um, you know, we had actually there's, there's a couple of them, but, uh, we had the February, 2018 event that's referred to as Volmageddon, which was the collapse of the XIV and related VIX ETF strategies. That was one where the size of the short vol trade associated with the inverse of the VIX, the XIV and a related product SVXY, there were a couple of them actually, um, had become so large that it was completely dominating the market for what are referred to as VIX futures or UX futures. Um, and when an event occurred that required that to be exited, on any normal day, those products were taking up 70% of the liquidity when you had a significant event that caused a general de-risking and caused people to try to unwind those trades, suddenly the requirement for liquidity jumped to somewhere in the neighborhood of 400 to 1,000 percent of what was actually available in the market. And exactly as we saw in 1987, transactions just stopped. The market makers stepped away. They had no contractual obligation to do so. And the product was able to fall in an unconstrained fashion that then turned around and bled into the S&P itself because people had to hedge out their exposure to volatility in one form or another. But that was a, a very clear example. We had a similar event in the fourth quarter of 2018 where um, a variety of products also in the short volatility space, what was referred to as an iron condor type strategy that was a less risky version of some of the short vol that had been in place those began to unwind in significant size at the same time that we began to see the first impacts in terms of flow of baby boomer retirements, right? So when, a, when you hit 70.5, these rules have changed slightly, so it's important to understand that. But when you hit 70.5, you have to start taking distributions from your 401ks and IRAs. 2018 was kind of the first time we really saw that happen in size. And so it, it, you know, a market event was created around these dynamics. Right. Mm. And, Go ahead. And I mean, I, I think it's just important to, to to contextualize what you're what you're describing, right? Because uh, February the fifth, two thousand eighteen, was Jay Powell's first day in office, and the Dow Jones fell over a thousand points, and he was he was much more of the Paul Volcker philosophical backstopping markets type, not you know not on my watch. And a few days later, you know, he, he gave flipped. his first congressional testimony and said it's not the Fed's job to backstop markets. At which mm. point, Balmageddon went poof. Yeah. Um, and at the same time, you know, as what you're talking about, demographics finally starting to play out, you'll remember, uh, you'll remember because we're coming right up to the two year anniversary of General Electric's debt being downgraded on Halloween yeah. 2018 of that year. And within 14 days, uh, you know, there was no there was no issuance for 41 days. The yep. junk market froze. So th that was a separate illiquidity event that it was exacerbated by what you're describing going on in the background and of course led up to Christmas Eve. Yeah, and so, you know, if you, if you remember, um, and one of my friends, uh, a gentleman by the name of Vincent Gillard at FCX Stone has just written a, an interesting piece that highlights, you know, the dates and the dynamics of when the markets have bottomed on these last several events, right? I'd so February, <laughs> the February 5th event, um, you know, had a, a recovery off of it. And, and I, you know, you actually, um, before we move off of that, I actually would highlight, I would actually say that the Fed had uh, a, a bigger role in those events than people are aware of. There was a change to what's called the CCAR provisions, right? The capital adequacy provisions uh, 
that occurred on February 2nd, where they changed a loophole that it existed for short vol positions. So the um, risk capital that needed to be held against an equity long was set so that um, the risk off event for an equity long was a th instantaneous 30% decline in the S&P 500, right? A repeat of the 1987 style events. Mm -hmm. The equivalent risk in terms of capital required to hold a short volatility position in the VIX products was a 10 point increase in the VIX, right? Now that's, those are nowhere near the same, right? That's the equivalent of saying there is no risk in short vol, there's extraordinary risk in owning equities. Guess what happened prior to February 2nd, 2018? Large short vol positions built up relative to long equity positions, right. which of course led people to look at equity positions and say, oh, it's not extended, there's no real risk here, et cetera. But all the risk was actually in the short vol products. That blew up when those CCAR provisions were changed and suddenly the street had to go out and seek significant hedging against the outstanding vol positions. So, you know, that's the sort of thing where I would actually say it was much less passive. It was a function of crowding and a Fed being unaware of what that change, that somewhat obscure change in CCAR provisions might set off. Well, the, the, the 59 trading days where the VIX closed in 2017 south of 10 yep. might have been a little bit of a flag for... Uh, for, for the feds and, and for regulators in general, but that, that's, I, I was on the inside and right after the crisis when they were starting to, you know, put extra provisions on banks at the same time that liquidity was coming down in the bond market. And I'm like, you can't combine those two. That's like that Ghostbuster scene. You're going to cross the streams, don't do it. And then poof, the bond market inventory blip. Anyways, um, no, it, and it won't be the last time that regulators don't quite understand the plumbing. Um, yeah, and, and, and you've done a better job, I think, of anyone else of highlighting that, you know, I've gone on record as saying, for the most part, I think the people at the Federal Reserve are very well intentioned, but there's a, a huge disconnect between the academic literature and the practitioner literature, right? And right. I wouldn't even say literature, practitioner dynamics. And we know you can't step into a market with billions of dollars and not influence that market. But that's the explicit assumption that underlines most of the models, right? They tend to treat these things, um, I mean, as you know, not having a PhD in economics, I don't either. We're basically taught that markets are occupied by people who make constant mistakes against an expected value type model, right? A very simplistic model. And so if you're trained to assume that fluctuations in financial markets are a byproduct of people constantly making mistakes, it doesn't become particularly hard philosophically to say, oh, I'm going to step in and fix people's mistakes because this is a mistake, mm -hmm. right? I'm going to correct them um, in a you know, very professorial or, or stentonian, stentorian tone, right? Um, if that's your viewpoint, if you think that fluctuations are caused by mistakes, as compared to simply people with different objective functions, different ages, different uh, utility functions. If I wanna buy a house today, my need to sell is much greater than somebody who might need to buy a house 10 years from now, right? And not taking into account those disparate motivations as being quite distinct, I think sets you up to interfere in a market in a potentially unproductive way on a long-term basis. It feels good as you do it, right? Everyone right. seems oh, at yeah. least somewhat happy. Well, and, and I think, uh, you know, I, it, I, I'm obviously not on the inside anymore, but the, 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 the shock of the coronavirus, and it was a black swan event, it was a shock. But you know, at, at the height of the great financial crisis, uh, corporate debt, non-financial debt to GDP was 74%. We entered 2020 with 78%. Yeah. So we entered with corporate America's balance sheet more levered up than it had ever been coming out of this not QE era because the Fed absolutely had to get reserves into the system. There was something very wrong with the plumbing in September of, of 2019 and people who were in the trenches knew it, knew it. Um, but there was, there was something that felt very orchestrated about March 23rd. You know, it, it, I, I you know, and again, I was not on the inside, but the coordination and the, the, the detailed aspects of what the Fed did tell me that at least somebody at the New York markets desk 
came up with a game plan after you know, kind of the Christmas Eve bloodbath that prompted the Powell pivot where he apologized on January the 4th, 2019, for ever making these comments about QE when he was a rookie in 2012. But something tells me that the Fed knew the dangers and had started studying it when Janet Yellen made comments in front of Congress that she had some concerns about the collateral backing exchange traded high yield funds. Uh, and it's a whole different whole different dynamic if you wouldn't mind getting into kind of crossing that other Rubicon of it's not just the S&P 500. Now we've delved into exchange traded funds that are backed by investment grade bonds, high yield bonds, leverage loans for heaven's sake. So I, th this again is one of the things and, and I want to be clear when I say this that I don't think that everything sits you know, passive isn't behind everything, but it is a huge, huge player in this. And so particularly when you talk about fixed income markets, I would actually suggest that we are seeing tremendous growth by, you know, in the, the share gain for passive bond indices is actually even more rapid than the share gain that occurred for equities. And part of that is a function of the market position and distribution channels of players like BlackRock and Vanguard who are able to negotiate preferential access to any number of savings programs, et cetera. And if you're a registered investment advisor, you know, Vanguard and BlackRock can afford to take you out golfing while the vast majority of people no longer really can, right? And so there's, again, not to cast aspersions on the RIAs because that's not what they're actually doing. They, they believe the research that says these are the best products. But part of the challenge that is created when you have these passive vehicles that have this really simple algorithm that says, if you give me cash, then buy. And the construction of the indices, particularly within the fixed income space, is such that they are market value weighted, which means that a company gets greater representation or a debt security gets greater representation in the index, the larger the issue is, so the more debt that is outstanding. And the second is the higher the price is. Right. And so perversely, we all know that fixed income instruments will only return a fixed amount over their lives. But paradoxically, the construction of these fixed income indices are such that if a bond is trading at 150, it is 50 percent more attractive than a bond that's trading at par. Right. 100. Now, that's insane. We know that's insane, but that's how these indices are constructed. Right. And it also drives an underlying dynamic where if you are a issuer, if you're a corporation that's issuing debt, all you care about is that you get Vanguard or BlackRock or one of the index providers to buy your debt because they're not gonna do any analysis on the covenants. They're not gonna do any analysis on your ability to repay, et cetera. They're gonna assume everybody else has done that work. And as a result, if the wall of money is going into people who assume that everyone else has done the work, you end up with debts that are priced as if they're flawless, right? And they're distinctly flawed. Many of these securities that occupy these indices no longer have the covenants associated with them. They're what we're referred to as covlight or no covenant in many situations. Those aren't debt securities, right? Debt securities actually give you a preferential right to direct management once the asset value has fallen below a certain level. If you have no covenants to enforce that, You've just bought really terrible equity, but yeah, that's I'm, how these these funds and these indices are constructed. Yeah, if um, I, I actually just did a deep dive into recovery rates, and because we've got quietly in the background, we have bankruptcies running at the highest since two thousand nine, uh, and, and recovery is running well below them, right? I mean, that's well, yeah, re recoveries were. 79 cents on the dollar, uh, and that was as bad as they got on leveraged loans. Right now, they're 47 cents. I Correct. Mean, and, and high yield bond recoveries are 15 cents on the dollar. I mean, the lowest we got last time, I think, was 22 cents on the, on the dollar. I mean, these are, I, I, I can't even wrap my head around this stuff. Stop and think about this. We literally just had Sabre Energy, which was a high yield issuer in the energy space. Their bonds went no recovery. Goldman Sachs had to take the bonds because there was no bid for the assets. Right. I mean, I, I, I don't think I've ever seen that happen for a publicly traded security before, but that's exactly what you would expect to happen when the only buyer is an index provider that assumes that whatever price it was able to come out at is the right price, which sets up an incentive structure for me as a participant in the underwriting 
to say, okay, well, I can dump it off to Vanguard as long as I know that it's going to go into this index. The corporation gains extraordinary leverage. The management team gains extraordinary leverage because they're able to construct this with no covenants, et cetera. Right. And as a result, we're getting exactly what you would expect and an, an incredible mispricing of the worst quality debt we've ever seen. I mean, when we came into when we came into 2020, Morgan Stanley did just a back of the envelope that said 42 percent of the investment grade universe on planet Earth should have been rated junk and was not. And that's why I say that it feels like there was such a script behind what the Fed was doing because they backstopped, grandfathered in and backstopped anything that was downgraded as a fallen angel from investment grade to high yield after March the 22nd. And now we've had record fallen angels. And we just, I feel like we are still in the process of whistling past the graveyard. And I mean, my final question to you, which I'm not going to get to yet, is has, has to do with what can break this dynamic. But first, I want to ask you a little bit more of a philosophical question, uh, because there has been something of an outgrowth of a combination of indexing and don't fight the Fed. And you know, not to be, there's no hyperbole here, but, but have we returned to a sort of robber, uh, robber baron era in the United States, where in the way markets are structured feeds into the growth of some of the largest companies, along with this idea of don't fight the Fed, you just need to be long. Well, so I, I, I um, yes, I think that we are in a new robber baron era. And I do think that the structure of the markets, particularly the dynamics of passive investing, facilitates the accumulation of capital at the highest levels. Right. And so just very quickly, I referred to the financial to, to the fixed income bond uh, index construction where market value determines how much money goes into a in, into an issue or into a company. We have the same thing as it relates to equities. Right. So they are float weighted or market cap weighted in terms of their construction. That means that if they go up in price, the next dollar that comes in puts more money in on a relative basis, right? And so it creates momentum. And that's exactly what we've seen has been the dominance of momentum strategies over value strategies, which would require people to make a discretionary choice of is this a good value or is it a bad value, right? And so what we've done is we've taken money away from those making those discretionary choices, given it to those who only make momentum choices and we've created a continued inflow of capital because of the dominance of passive vehicles in things like 401ks. So while we talk about passive share being somewhere in the neighborhood of 50% of managed assets, about 40% of US equity assets overall, about 25% of US fixed income assets, that's a very poor characterization of the actual structure of the market because the younger generations, those who are actively saving as compared to those who are withdrawing their capital they're over 90% passive, right? So all the money that's coming in, more than 100% of the flows into the market is coming into passive vehicles that have these momentum weights. And what of course that means is, is that each incremental dollar, more of it goes to an Apple or to a Google or to a Microsoft than it does to other securities. And in our analysis, at least, that creates a disparate impact that, that creates a reinforcing loop on that type of momentum behavior. And the only way that ends is when money starts to come out of those types of strategies. Um, well, we'll, again, ho hold that thought for just another nope. minute. Uh, but is there a difference between kind of blindly having most of your, of your proceeds, mo most of what you're saving on your behalf flowing into a 401k and actively building a diversified portfolio of ETFs. So you've got, ET I mean, you've got ETFs everywhere. I think there are more ETFs now than there are mutual funds. Uh, but but are, are there certain venues, are there certain uh, portfolios where you can build out kind of a traditional, think about the efficient frontier, a traditional well-diversified portfolio of ETFs? Um, so, one of the interesting things is while there's been a massive proliferation of ETFs, um, there's, uh, I 
personally track somewhere in the neighborhood of 1500 ETFs, right? So I, I know there's more than that, but that's the cutoff basically. Of that 1500, which are the largest ETFs in the US markets, only 50 are gaining assets, right? So the ETF space in aggregate is really dominated by a few small players like VOO, the Vanguard uh, ETF, VBR, uh, which is a, a another, you know, Vanguard type products, BlackRock type products, State Street type products, some Invesco products, just completely dominate the growth that's occurring in the industry. Um, those account for more than 100% of the flows that are going into the ETF space. And so the kind of you know, interesting thematic sort of thing, like, you know, a robot ETF or a green energy ETF, those will occasionally capture people's attention, but they don't really fit into the very simple asset allocation models that many registered investment advisors and financial advisors are choosing for their clients. They kind of treat it as like, well, that's play money, right? You can put a little bit into those, but at your core should be the Vanguard Total Market Index, a Vanguard Bond Index, you know, a uh, Vanguard International Exposure, and a Vanguard maybe a small cap or a Vanguard, uh, you know, uh, tax advantaged uh, bond type fund, right? Whether that's tips or anything else, right? Super simple portfolios. That's what everybody is looking for. They want simplicity, and the ETFs play into that, but only in a very narrow space. So. Um, how, how does the Fed and QE play into, how, how, and, and I'm, I'm, speaking, I'm speaking more about the actual level of purchases made on a, on a monthly basis, all of that money pouring into the financial system. How does that make its way through to bolstering liquidity, helping put a floor underneath markets? Well, I, I think that's one of the things that's so fascinating is, is, is this idea of a Fed put or this idea that the Fed will step in to bail out investors and, and is there to protect investors. That's really only a narrative that occurs amongst discretionary managers, right? I mean, no one who is 25 years old, whose uh, participation in their the stock market is tied to their 401k at work, where their employer has a 3% match. And, you know, they're automatically routed into, let's say they're 25 years old, so they'll turn 65, you know, sometime in 2070, give or, uh, yeah, 20, 2075, they're going to be in a target date fund that is tied to that maturity, right, that end of their working, you know, life. Nowhere in that strategy does it say, hey, do you think the Fed is going to increase interest rates or lower interest rates? Uh, at the next meeting, right? That participation isn't involved in any way, shape or form, nor is it incorporated into the behavior of these target date funds that now represent the vast majority of the money that is going into these types of products. Where the discretion occurs is on the part of the active manager who says, uh, I think the Fed is gonna step in, therefore there's very little risk, therefore I don't need to hold cash or I might even lever my portfolio to gain increased exposure to try to keep up with the benchmarks, right? Um, that, that I think is where that dialogue of don't fight the Fed, et cetera, exists. And we see this in the risk on risk off behavior, which is often a function of the active discretionary managers changing their direction or their loadings. And so that's what we really saw in the spring of 2020. There was no change until the layoffs began in March. There was no change to contributions in 401ks. There was nothing nothing changed, right? And yet suddenly the active managers got cold feet and they said, oh my gosh, this is really, really terrible. We need to sell. And so they tried to raise cash and discovered that their lowering prices in order to facilitate that didn't attract additional buyers, right? That same 25 year old doesn't get an alert from their 401k that says, hey, prices are down 5% versus yesterday. Would you like to buy more, right? It just doesn't happen. And as a result, when they went to try to sell on that risk off event, there were no more buyers, prices collapsed. Now, in terms of the Fed behavior and kind of this 23rd date, I think there's a couple of different components that go into that. One is absolutely the Fed stepped in with some very targeted actions, for example, supporting bond funds through BlackRock, right? Hiring BlackRock to allocate capital is kind of the ultimate example to me of, you know, giving the fox control of feeding the hens, right? 
Um, the second thing though that happened, and this is one of those weird market structure things that people tend not to be aware of. And again, I mentioned uh, the work of my friend Vincent. The 23rd is roughly the date at which a target date fund would have to look at their portfolio and say, okay, we are supposed to have a balance between equities and bonds. The bonds have risen, the equities have fallen so much. So what am I going to do? I'm going to sell bonds and I'm going to buy equities. Right? That's what they have to do contractually in their, in their um, target date fund structure. Well, there's a ready buyer for bonds because the Fed just announced that they're going to increase the quantity of bonds that they're going to buy. Right? So selling those bonds is easy. And going out and buying the equities starts to drive the price of the equities higher. And immediately everyone says, oh, guess what? It was because of Fed QE that stock prices went up. That's, I think there's some truth to that, but I actually think that it has much more to do with the systematic dynamics. And those dynamics have governed the last four events. March 23rd, 2018, which was the bottom associated with Volmageddon. December 24th on 2018, it would have been the 23rd if that hadn't been a Sunday. So the 24th is, is the next day that's available to you. Then again, we had it occur in September 23rd of 2000, uh, I think it was 2019, that it was September 23rd. And then we had March 23rd again in 2020. These are after option expiries. These are at the point that the target date funds have to start the rebalancing. Is the Fed aware of this? I mean, I've had conversations with them. I think they're starting to be aware of it. And so they may, there may be some coordination of, okay, now would be a really good time because it allows us to pretend that we're actually doing this. But I'm a little skeptical that the Fed is actually fully aware of this. So what, what is the magnitude of versus, let's say, the 70 trillion that I brought up before with RIAs that are 88% flowing into these ETFs? What is the magnitude of target date funds? Kind of an, just a broad versus this $70 trillion kind of monster out there? Well, so it's quite small relative to that 70 trillion monster, but remember that that 70 trillion monster incorporates all global assets, right? right. So right. when you talk about the size of these products, particularly for younger generations in equities, they become pretty meaningful. So total market cap in the United States is around 3 trillion. On any given day, you're going to see kind of, you know, uh, tens to hundreds of billions of dollars worth trade. But remember that the difference on that is quite small, right? So if Apple trades $2 billion worth of shares in a day, but the price only moves by a penny, that tells you that you had a pretty tight balance between the buyers and the sellers. Yep. If the price goes up a dollar or down a dollar, right, then that actually is telling you that there was an imbalance in one direction or another, right? And so when the, the target date funds are stepping in, as they did on March 23rd of 2020, and buying because of an underweight of like 10%, you're potentially talking somewhere in the neighborhood of 100 to $200 billion worth of equity buying that has to occur. Sure. That's giant. That, yeah. On any, on any given trading day, absolutely. Yes. So you know, it, it was interesting that right before his death that Vogel said that passive had become too big. And he was starting to make some rumblings almost as if he'd been talking on the phone with you uh, about passing this 50% line in the sand uh, and what the implications would be if passive was really no longer passive anymore because it was so big. Yeah. So I think Bogle had a, diff had a difficult place in history because unquestionably his products are adopted and used by millions of Americans and have created a tremendous amount of wealth. But his relationship with his, the firm he founded, Vanguard, actually became quite strained in the late 1990s as Vanguard began to capitalize on its market position and introduce products that made him nervous, right? So things like ETFs, things like active rebalancing, he was generally opposed to that. And as you mentioned, is of kind of May 2017, he gave a speech in which he said, you know, if everyone were to go passive, it would be complete disaster. Markets would fail, right? Most people tend to think that's way off into the future. And the reason that they think that is because they assume that markets are truly liquid, transparent, relatively frictionless, et cetera. The data increasingly just doesn't support that. Right, the, the, the participation in, in 
a strategy can very rapidly crowd a market, even one as large as the S&P 500 or the US equity markets. So uh, you're, you're ending this perfectly. And uh, demographically is one aspect. Fundamentally is another. I mean, from my perch, following the macroeconomy, we're seeing permanent joblessness rise. We're seeing joblessness climb up the income ladder into white collar. Uh, we're also seeing what looks to be uh, not necessarily a second wave of the virus, but a, a full-blown second wave of, of layoffs and bankruptcies, which had tamped down in August and September, look to be picking back up in October. And I think if a lot of companies feel that the last few months of 2020 aren't going to be this massive rebound that had been factored in and priced in. So where do demographics play into passive investing? And do, will fundamentals ever matter? Because again, what you're describing and listening to, I, I don't listen to it, I, I keep it on mute, but when, when Bloomberg's on in the background, there is a lot of talk about the idea of QE infinity. In fact, Fed policymakers are saying that QE is going to be a permanent fixture going forward. And I think that that has the potential to provide reassurance to people that status quo as it is today with markets, just generally speaking, having hiccups along the way, but, but rising steadily is what, what could upset that dynamic? Well, I mean, there's a variety of things that can upset that dynamic. Demographics, of course, is one of them because we have a large accumulated stockpile of assets associated with the boomers and those older than the boomers that need to be liquidated, right? So when we talk about IRAs or 401ks combined, they're about $17.5 trillion in assets. As they are increasingly managed by things like target date funds or robo-advisor type frameworks, it says you should have X amount in the S&P 500, X amount in small cap, X amount in international stocks, et cetera. As that becomes more and more a function of pre-programmed ages, right? And people are looking for these very simplistic rather than idiosyncratically composed portfolios for all their flaws, at least people were doing somewhat different things, right? But when you have this sort of demographic dynamic associated with the baby boomers that ultimately need to sell those assets in order to fund their retirements, to fund their consumption, the real risk that you have is the increase in fragility that's created by these super simplistic algorithms that simply say, if you give me cash, then buy. And likewise, if you ask for cash, then sell. Well, what price should I sell? Whatever price I can get, right? And that suggests to me that what we're likely to see is this type of behavior where equities continue to become more volatile, fixed income continues to become more volatile as the process of price discovery is increasingly impaired by these actors. Because mm -hmm. you're, you're saying sell at whatever price there is out there, so put in a market sell. Well, and, and, and the perverse dynamic is, so the, the Boston Fed, a, a, a friend of mine at the Boston Fed, um, an individual who I respect a lot, put out a piece recently talking about passive investing and does it represent systematic risk, right? And um, one of the things that they highlight about things like ETFs is, is that potentially they reduce liquidity demands because instead of being sold for cash, they could theoretically be returned in kind, right? So instead of you having to sell your HYG and receiving cash for it at a distressed price, well, they could just give you the underlying bonds. Right. And, and I look at that and I go, that's the most insane thing I've ever heard. Right. Like, what is the average American going to do with a low grade bond that was suddenly deposited into their account when they asked for cash? They're going to sell it without any form of professional trader who's trying to find the best execution of price. They're just going to dump it into the market. This is this is a complete disaster if that's what you think is providing liquidity. Well, that and they have to like they know this. They have to know that's the case. But there's an extraordinary amount of effort that is being put out by organizations that people think are working in their interest, right? Vanguard has a great story about how they're out there for the small investor, et cetera. And the crazy part is, I think they actually believe it. It's very cult-like behavior there. But at the end of the day, that's not a solution. And we saw this, you know, many Vanguard bond ETF products. I would highlight something like BND, for example, Mm -hmm. That went to a that went to a, a seven percent discount to its NAV in the events of March 2020, right? Now that's seventy percent treasuries. 
So what that's telling you is, is that the corporate bond component of it, which is all investment grade, had to be trading at a 21% discount. Right? Like, that's not a liquid product under those conditions. And that's why I would argue that the Fed stepped in so aggressively to try to mitigate those risks on a short-term basis. But exactly as you said, they separated us from the fundamentals, which continue to deteriorate in many of those situations. Well, I mean, there, there, there was a time in the days that preceded that the long bond itself was not trading in Asia and trading in the middle of the night. So, I mean... Yeah, really no, there, were, there were lots of challenges associated with that. It was, it was not what it used to be. So. No, it is definitely. And, and I think it's important for people to remember that liquidity doesn't always mean what we think it means. So when the Fed adds liquidity, mm -hmm. it doesn't mean that they're actually out there facilitating the transaction of the securities that you happen to own. What they're actually saying when they provide liquidity is, is that they are allowing people who want to trade to borrow and post collateral so that they can execute. Right. And by the same token, we're not seeing commercial and industrial loans go up. You know, the, the revolvers were initially drawn down and now the, the reserves are just, banks are piling into more and more and more treasuries every day. They're not, they're not making new loans. Well, and, and, and we see not just that, we also see you know, that tends to come through as, as various forms of misinformation, right? So when a CNI uh, loan is taken down or when a, more importantly, a line of credit, right? A revolver is taken down that money flows into a, a money market mutual fund. And that then gets reported to the public as, oh, look, cash balances have exploded, right? And there's tons of tons of cash on the sidelines. Well, there's a huge difference between cash that was raised by individuals in their brokerage accounts and cash that was created because lines of credit or um, revolvers have been drawn down in advance of the event. Those can't be used to buy stocks. Right. And those ultimately have to be repaid. There's a subsequent withdrawal of that liquidity that is approaching. And when that occurs, I would expect to see further stress in the credit markets. Yeah. And you've already heard banks say that they're, they're already taking losses on some of the retailers who drew down those lines and are no longer with us. Absolutely. Going, correct. going concerns. Um, any, any last words on on fundamentals? I, I know that's not kind of your your specialty, if you will, but, but I'd be curious to hear what your views are given this extraordinary macroeconomic backdrop, not just here in the United States, but heck, globally. Well, I, so I would actually highlight that the United States tends to be our focus um, for the very simple reason that it's the largest, most liquid market. And people tend to focus on the fact that the United States is disadvantaged because we have to go to the rest of the world to satisfy many of our consumption needs, right? So we run large trade deficits, for example, right? Well, part of the problem with that is what you're actually saying with a trade deficit is, is that we're interested in consuming things like, you know, trinkets from China or semiconductors or iPhones or various other things. But we're actually providing the aggregate demand to the rest of those countries around the world, right? So if we step away, you know, I, I have this conversation with people regularly. If we step away, where does China turn to meet its consumption needs. It's certainly not to China because China has a shrinking population and labor force at this point. Right. Europe is the exact same. Japan is the exact same. The only place around the world that has a growing market for consumption goods is the United States. And if we can't afford to do that because of adverse outcomes here, then the rest of the world takes it much worse in my analysis. And I, I, so as bad as things are here, I think we sometimes do ourselves a disservice by not paying attention to what's happening to the rest of the world. The other thing that, that you're highlighting is that the CARES Act and the Paycheck Protection Program effectively bought us time and turned many forms of labor into a cost plus exercise, right? So we will lend you money that we expect to forgive that allows you to pay your employees and you can keep 40% of it to cover other costs, like the rent of your unit, right? In many situations, small business people took advantage of both, didn't pay the rent, didn't hold reserves to ultimately um, repay the loans that they've taken out with the expectation that they're going to be forgiven, effectively kept their employees on, but allowed the real options to expire. And I would suggest that we've seen a lot of this. We've seen people that have delayed paying their rents that have now accumulated rents. There's no prospect of getting current on. People have delayed paying their mortgage. There's no prospect of getting current on those mortgages, right? People have delayed it on commercial properties. 
As a result, you're going to see a large number of businesses that have cleared out their inventory and sold it off just go away, right? And all of those things are in process right now. To me, it's actually quite distressing to watch what's happening because the last part is policymakers tend to look to the expectations channel. Going back to that 1970s discussion, they tend to look to the expectations channel to tell them how urgent it is that they do something. And so when equity markets and bond markets are trading at all time highs, they look at it and say, well, it's not that urgent. Whereas in March with markets down dramatically, oh my gosh, it's the second great depression. We have to move very, very quickly. We have to have giant amount of stimulus, et cetera. Now you're seeing everyone basically saying, yeah, not that urgent. Mm -hmm. Right. Exactly the opposite. It's, I would argue it's the exact opposite. I think it was incredibly urgent in March. Um, what I've highlighted for people is, is that I think we made almost every possible mistake we could in the interim period. And instead of getting our economy back to work, we chose that to use that largesse to shut it down and you know, further cement kind of the permanent damage that, that you're highlighting so effectively. Well, I hope that we can come together uh, in, uh, you know, in another six months or so and, and look back on 2020 and, uh, and, and not have other, other things that end with Ageddon uh, to talk about. I'm, I'm not sure how this is going to go, but, uh, but I do appreciate all of your time. You do a great service explaining something that for most people is a passive thought. Yeah. So uh, where, whereas they, they need to be much more active. In fact, the first thing I'm going to do is, is, is tell my friends with big 401ks that if they jump through a bunch of hoops that they can self-direct them. So <laughs> that's what I'll I, th- I think that's important. And I think one of the, the real challenges, unfortunately, is, is that your audience and my audience, people that pay attention to this sort of stuff are actually naturally prone to being thoughtful about it. Right. It's the people that aren't listening that tend to be, you know, for, for many of the people that are in our audience, there's frustration because it's not clear what you should do, but there's an awareness that something needs to be done, at least. That's the first part of the battle. The vast majority of people, they just aren't thinking about this. Well, I hope no, we've changed not. that to some degree today. Hope so. I hope so. Because this will be a broader audience than what you're used to. Excellent. Well, thank you very much, Daniel. Thank you. Take good care. Uh, enjoy living out there in that perfect weather while the rest of us descend into winter. And for Valuetainment, this is Danielle DiMartino Booth, and thank you so much for joining today. Well, that might have been more than most people can wrap their heads around in an hour and a half, but I learned a lot. I hope that you learned a lot listening to Mike Green. Uh, This is Danielle DiMartino Booth with Down the Middle with DiMartino Booth, and I hope you join me next time. And if you happen to have missed my discussion with Brigadier General Robert Spaulding, you can catch that right here. I look forward to your comments. Thank you.